Welcome back. I'm here today with Nicholas Hope. He is the director for the Stanford Center for Economic Development, also known as SCID. Welcome to today's show. Thanks a lot, Alan. Pleasure to be here. So, uh, you came to Stanford University and you run this organization for a period of years, uh, working with, let's step back a few, a few years, and what brought you to Stanford and your, your background prior to coming? Uh, I started as an academic, I uh, spent a lot of time in universities and uh, finished a PhD in economics in the mid-70s. And I was teaching in Australia at the time and then I joined the World Bank. And I spent 24 years uh, in the World Bank uh, initially as an economist doing mainly work on international finance and then lending money. Uh, part of the, uh, the latter period I was country director for China and I lent about 10 billion dollars to China in three and a half years and uh, I wouldn't say I fell in love with the place exactly but I was intrigued by the, uh, the complexity of what they were trying to do and the projects that we did there I thought were extraordinary. I mean they, they were very impressive projects and so when the bank reorganized and decided to move me around um, I felt I still had more to learn about China and perhaps even more to give to China. And Stanford offered me the possibility of coming and joining this new center, initially as deputy director, and running a China research program. So I came and tried it out for a year and a half and then Stanford offered me the job and I retired from the bank in 2000 and I've been at Stanford ever since. So 12 years at, uh, I guess it's going 14 years at Stanford That's now. That's correct, yeah. Um, what is the mission for the Stanford Center for Economic Development? Well, uh, our original director was uh, Professor Ann Krieger, who went on to be the uh, first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund as part of her illustrious career. And her concern when she set up the center was to uh, renew uh, the high level scholarship in the United States on the major developing countries. I think her feeling was that for various reasons, interest in these emerging markets had uh, flagged in academic circles in the US. And she proposed to uh, establish uh, a center that would refocus uh, economic policy research uh, on uh, China and India, the two most populous countries, and then initially one of the big economies in Latin America. And eventually she, uh, she said, okay, let's do Latin America, but with a focus on Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico. But our two biggest focuses have been on what sorts of policy changes would help performance in China and India. What are some of the similarities between the Chinese economy and the U.S.? Um, it's a it, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, it's easy to it's easy to see the, the 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 things that are different from the things that are really similar. The, the, to me, the biggest. Well, let's start with the differences. Well, let's, let's, do, yeah. the, let's okay. do the similarities because okay. the, the, to me, the biggest similarity is size. Okay. I mean, the U.S. is the world's biggest economy. The Chinese is the second biggest economy. Although that, to me, that would have been an inconceivable statement 20 years ago. I mean, there would have been no way I would have said, "Well, China is going to be as big as it is now." And China is now the biggest trading economy if we simply look at merchandise trade, and it's surpassed the United States as the second biggest. That too would have been an inconceivable statement. So the similarity is that in each of these countries, what they do has material impact on the rest of the world. I think sometimes American policymakers forget that fact that what's done here uh, causes uh, tremendous repercussions throughout the global economy and actually complicates matters for many other policy makers in other countries. I think the Chinese uh, started their reform process and Deng Xiaoping uh, very clearly said, let's keep our head down and get rich. Let's not disturb people, let's not make waves. Uh, but that's not possible anymore because China is so big that if it does things domestically that uh, impact the international economy, then there are reverberations and consequences. And I think increasingly the leadership has to take that into account when they go ahead and do, do certain things in the domestic economy. Differences, uh, China's still uh, uh, very much dependent on manufacturing. I mean, the US has got a huge manufacturing sector, but as a share of employment in the US economy, manufacturing has come down markedly at, and services have moved ahead. Indeed, Chinese are seeing service sectors develop quite 
quite rapidly, less sophisticated ones than one typically sees in the United States. But they still have a very large manufacturing base, and one would argue that the uh, you know the initial cause of their growing prosperity was this transition to uh, low wage blue collar uh, manufacturing, uh, largely done for foreign markets. So it was this sort of export led surge in manufacturing that started the uh, the Chinese growth phase. I'm visiting here today with Nicholas Hope. He is the director of the Stanford Center for Economic Development. And um, Nick, we need to take a quick break, and we'll be back at this, back after these messages, and we'll talk more about China. Okay. Thanks. I love fishing, you know, with my family. I think it would be easier to use a net. It was so much fun. The times when we are together, it makes it all, all the more worth it. Having dad teach them how to like cast a fly rod and. As long as we're doing stuff together, we're having fun. Some people see a father and a son fishing together, while others see a succession plan. Welcome back. I'm here today with Nicholas Hope. He is the director of the Stanford Center for Economic Development, and Nick, we've been talking about China. How friendly is uh, China to entrepreneurship? Uh, that's a really good question, Alan. I, I think they talk a good game, and so you'd say in principle extremely friendly. Uh, in practice, perhaps a little less so. They depend very heavily, and perhaps too much so, and uh, it's become a, a, a uh, sort of somewhat concerning trend since the uh, international financial crisis on the state enterprise system. Uh, you know, they see the state enterprise system as the sort of underpinning of the of growth, and they've forgotten a little bit, I think, the 80s and 90s when it was the emergence of dynamic, uh, at least quasi-private enterprise that was driving the uh, the uh, growth miracle that we've observed in China. Uh, but they do talk a lot about innovation, entrepreneurship. In fact, every second word now seems to be innovation when you're in China. And we actually are doing a project currently with the Policy Research Office at the State Council. A couple of uh, Stanford academics, one from Berkeley and me, and then a group at, uh, in China as well. And it's comparing the way in which the US approaches entrepreneurship with what one sees in China. You know, we still maintain about half the venture company venture capital money in the world right here in Silicon Valley and uh, I, how has Silicon Valley interacted with all their innovation entrepreneurship to China? What's the tie-in and how do, how do the VCs view what's going it, on it, there? It's a, it's a very interesting question. I mean now I think there's uh, it's much more positive than when I first came to Stanford. At the time uh, I think a lot of VCs worried first about the uh, very dodgy nature of the Chinese legal system. Uh, if you're in and something goes wrong, is there any real prospect that uh, the courts will support your uh, your claim or, or essentially secure your property rights for you? And the answer was clearly no. So for many of the, of the investors, the, the overriding concern was exit. Uh, we put money into a promising firm, uh, how do we get out? Uh, we were often approached to say to the government, uh, let these companies go to IPOs immediately uh, so we can uh, clear our money, get it out, uh, make the profit that we've earned and uh, not have to go through any complicated process. Uh, I actually felt that the government was right to be cautious. Uh, the Shanghai market, I think, in the early stages was a very much of a Casino. It was a crap game in, in which the the uh, uh, underlying uh, information that was provided about listed companies was uh, was uh, not necessarily very credible. Uh, now I think things have changed. I think there are many ways now to get out, uh, principally acquisition. But both the private equity groups now and the venture capital seem much more comfortable with the environment as it's evolved. What are some of the international issues that need to be addressed with China? They're myriad. Um, security uh, is one. Uh, environment and, uh, and global warming uh, would be another. Uh, two biggest uh, generators of uh, greenhouse gases are China and the United States. 
Uh, Anti-terrorism uh, would be a third. Uh, China's got its own domestic uh, problems with terrorism and uh, uh, they are, I think, at somewhat at a loss to know how to manage the situation. It's, uh, it's difficult. I'm an economist, so my biggest concern for the US and China is, uh, is, is as we move ahead, how can we uh, maintain healthy competition but at the same time ensure that policy coordination is done at the international level to the extent that the sorts of policies that uh, both countries... He's the world's most trustworthy man. Tax filing deadlines are scheduled around his vacation calendar. The IRS agent who audited his client apologized. <laughs> I don't always advise people on their taxes. But when I do, I save them every penny legally possible. Groco CPAs and Advisors. Come to Groco and stay wealthy, my friend. Welcome back. I'm here today with Nicholas Hope. Uh, he's a director for the Stanford Center for Economic Development, and uh, we've been talking about China. Uh, Nicholas, back in 1975, China implemented a one child policy. And uh, as we roll that forward to today, uh, how does China's how is China's population affected by the, putting that policy in place, and what problems do you foresee in the near term of uh, how they're going to what, what they need to work on? The the issue. Uh, this is uh, one of our former PhD students who works for Goldman Sachs in Hong Kong. Wrote a paper that said, uh, "Will China be old before it's rich?" And uh, what is increasingly happening, uh, particularly given where they're very low retirement age, 55 for women, 60 for men, um, it means that uh, the Chinese are living a long time after they retire. So paying pensions has become a very costly business. And with fewer Chinese entering the workforce, which has peaked a little bit over 750 million, it's now declining as uh, fewer children uh, enter the workforce. It's better quality, many more educated people, much more university, tertiary level education. But what one sees is uh, increasingly the burden of, uh, of elderly people uh, on fewer workers. And of course, the elderly people also look to see an improving lifestyle. They, uh, they don't expect to be uh, miserably poor in old age, and particularly not the really old people who sacrificed a lot uh, during the early phases of reform. So, you know, there are ways to deal with pension issues, but we know they're politically difficult because we see the problems the US has with the social security system and China's problems mirror uh, the US problems almost exactly. How big can China's economy get? Are we just starting or is this uh, we're not, is there a long we're way not, to go? We're not just starting. I mean, the growth is slowing and there's some, obviously some real issues currently with how to maintain the sort of growth that the the president has sort of staked his reputation on the seven and a half percent a year. But the economy is now so big that it's got to slow. You can't grow, nothing grows 10 percent forever. An economy that's nine billion, uh, sorry, nine trillion US dollars, uh, you know, allow for seven and a half real, perhaps two and a half percent inflation. So it's a 10 percent growth. That's nearly a trillion dollars a year that they're adding to the economy. That, that can't continue forever. But if one looks at the per capita income, $6,000, an eighth or, or thereabouts of what the uh, average per capita income is in the US, there's enormous scope for continued growth in the Chinese economy and, uh, and a much greater average wealth for the, uh, the Chinese citizen. Um, how far that can go with existing technologies would be the would be the question one would ask. I mean, if you're going to gen generate all your electricity from burning coal, or if you were going to have a very resource intensive construction sector, uh, uses lots of steel and cement and uh, copper, etc., then the question would be, uh, at what point do you run into, uh, into uh, fairly severe constraints on growth that simply stem from the, the types of uh, technologies that you're implementing? I'm quite optimistic that, uh, that we can find um, 
solutions to that sort of constraint that technological uh, ad advances will make it possible for China, perhaps not to grow as fast as it did in the 90s and 2000s, but continue to grow considerably faster than the developed countries for uh, another generation, uh, at which point uh, China would be moderate, moderately prosperous by its own definition, perhaps uh, income per capita is close to twenty or $25,000. What are some of the social issues that, issues that China needs to deal with? Uh, to me, the two, the two biggest social issues, I mean, there's a question of economic reform and how they're going to push it forward and they've got blueprints that uh, are impressive, and, uh, but the proof of the pudding. I mean, you've got to see how they implement some of these proposed changes. The, the problem that perhaps wasn't foreseen, although Deng Xiaoping said that as a price for growth, we will get greater inequality in the Chinese economy. But I don't think he had in mind the inequality that now exists. Uh, the, the gap between the, the extraordinarily wealthy and then the, uh, the, the still quite poor, better off but poor, is vast. And that's a tremendous potential threat to social stability when people decide uh, out in uh, Gansu or, or uh, uh, Shanxi or, or Hunan that uh, people in Shanghai or Beijing or, or uh, Shenzhen have got it uh, much better than they do, at what point do they demand that the uh, distribution of the benefits from growth be more even? And then to me, the, uh, the emergence of, a, of an urban middle class uh, makes a, a compelling argument for uh, the Chinese government finding ways to allow their people to have a voice in their own governance. And I'm not saying that means uh, Western-style democracy, but you do need a more pluralistic system in which uh, if the government is performing poorly, if I'm a, let me take Shanghai, if I'm a resident of Shanghai and uh, I'm uh, comfortable, I'm a lawyer, a doctor, a, a businessman, I've uh, got my uh, kids in a school that I think is performing badly, uh, public transport doesn't work well, the electricity supply is less reliable than I want, I don't, don't, don't trust the water, sewerage systems don't work too well, there's lots of pollution, who do I complain to? Uh, in this country, you sack the mayor. In uh, China, the mayor and the party secretary, who's his boss, they're appointed from Beijing. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're more accountable to the leadership in Beijing than they are to their own constituents. Nicholas, we, we need to take a quick break. And I love these issues, uh, the social issues in government. I want to I hold you over for the last segment today. And in that segment, I want to get into... Uh, this question of can the Chinese government be lobbied? <laughs> hey, well, we're visiting here today with Nicholas Hope. He's a director for the Stanford Center for Economic Development, and we'll be right back after these messages. With current laws, we have left our children an enormous financial burden. Even though they may be too young to understand it. At GroCo, we care about you and the ones you love and the quality of your and their lives. Call us today to see how we can help. 877-CPA-2006. helping you along the way. Welcome back and visiting here today with Nicholas Hope. We've been talking about China and uh, Nicholas serves, currently serves as the director for the Stanford Center for Economic Development and um, we were talking about uh, some of the social infrastructure challenges that China has, and I want to bring this back to Silicon Valley's interaction with China. Uh, a lot of venture capitalists, uh, they've been going there, they've been putting money in, and uh, but, but they, they show concerns about, um, is it possible to lobby the Chinese government or try to help the government uh, be a little bit more friendly towards the way that the U.S. is doing business. And I'd like to throw that out as a rhetorical question to, uh, is it possible to lobby there in China still? Or yeah, I th Yes, I think it is. Uh, and I think uh, certainly at the level of the central government, there's quite a uh, receptive audience there for it. I mean, the, the government of China has been, uh, from the get-go, to some degree unlike Japan and Korea before it, but China's been very receptive to foreign investment. It's always wanted foreign investment. 
much of the early foreign investment was overseas Chinese coming back to the ancestral villages and setting up a small manufacturing outfit and shipping all the stuff they produced abroad. But um, in Beijing, I think the government has been keen, uh, to say the least, to bring in direct investment. And actually, in recent years, uh, at the municipal or, or even provincial level, the, the, the hunger for foreign investment has been even more avid. I mean, they've just wanted foreign investment with the idea this is going to create jobs, promote growth, and generally uh, help me in my career. Uh, because the more of these good things I can do, the more likely that the leadership will recognise my merits and I'll uh, move up the, up the ladder. Um, the problem, of course, for the foreign investor is, uh, is the uh, unreliability of the legal system. So the chances that your property rights will be respected in the event that you and your partners have a falling out, uh, I think in the past that's been uh, comparatively low. The uh, other issue, of course, is theft of intellectual property. Um, it's a national sport in China and uh, I don't think that's changed very much, uh, but the big boys, uh, the Hewlett Packards, the Cisco's, uh, and others, Intel's, they've been able, I think, to marshal enough legal heft that in the event of something too egregious, they've been able to step in. And, uh, and I think the Chinese government has, uh, has certainly made it clear that uh, some behaviours of, uh, of, of its, its uh, entrepreneurs or partners of the big companies are, is not so good. My interaction with, uh, with go government officials, particularly over the, the period in which they entered the WTO, uh, was that many of them thought this was a great opportunity, not just to bring uh, the Chinese uh, central legislation up to international standards, but to begin to crack the whip over the provinces on some of these issues. I think that uh, at, at a, in a period when the Chinese government was, uh, was very sensitive to the idea that they were stealing national intellectual property, um, at the level of the provinces, it was uh, make hay while the sun was shining. I mean, uh, copy anything you can get your hands on, any DVD, any video, I mean, anything was fair game. Um, and of course, when the center did move in and closed down the operation, it was all fine in terms of the local government uh, saying, you know, a wink is as good as a nod and uh, you may have been closed down here, but what's wrong with moving up the street? I, I love all this content where we're talking about China, but uh, to find out more information, they'll go to skid, S-C-I-D yeah. dot Stanford dot edu. Yes, and that'll give you information about our programs and our recent activities and events. We've been visiting here today with Nicholas Hope. He is the director for the Stanford Institute of Economic Development. Nicholas, thanks for being on today's my, show. My pleasure, Alan. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being here on America Dreams. Join us next week right here on this station.